The Fishing News is sponsored by these fine partners. Drone footage high above the beach at Manasquan this week on Valentine's Day is yet another dead whale. I believe the ninth in New York and New Jersey since December comes ashore in the pocket. Footage of what NOAA Fisheries calls a series of unusual whale mortality events courtesy of Angry Fish Gallery in Point Pleasant. This bird's eye view of the quote, scene of the crime, unquote, as investigations continue into what is causing these strange and morbid marine mammal deaths along the Atlantic coast. More on this latest dead humpback video at the scene with deep thoughts from NOAA Fisheries and an interview with Clean Ocean Action later in the forecast. But first, let's look at this upcoming show weekend and the latest reports we have here at the Fisherman Magazine. I'm Jim Hutchinson with the New Jersey Delaware Bay Edition. It's Thursday, February 16th, 2023, and we're officially just 13 days away from the March 1st opening of Outback Stripers in the Garden State. Yes, that's less than two weeks away. But before we get to talking about white perch, cod, blackfish, and the latest whale death at the Jersey Shore, let's run down the incredible show weekend coming up. I'm in Edison right now for the kickoff of the New Jersey Boat Sale and Expo. It opens its doors Thursday, today, uh, in just a little while. We're actually finishing up the setup and it's going to be a great event. This show runs through Sunday afternoon. That's right, it's here at the New Jersey Expo Convention Center, Edison. It's presented by the Marine Trades Association of New Jersey. Now, while I was here setting up the show on Wednesday, I had a chance to watch some of the boats being hauled in and polished and set up, uh, looked at some of the great outboard en engines that are coming through, this is a great event for those of you looking for some of the, let's say, smaller models, the skiffs, the center consoles, maybe pontoon boats. Consider smaller, more economical craft. It's a great event for that, and all the dealers from throughout the Garden State are here. You can find the Fisherman Magazine's booth here. We're actually set up right where these beautiful little Sienna, uh, Savannah skiffs are with those gorgeous Suzuki outboards. Plus. You've got seminars on Thursday, kicking off with my striped bass discussion, followed by Nick Konicheski's Jersey Shore Exotics, and then Aaron Held from Octopus Yachts. We'll talk about trolling motor installation and what goes into that, and perhaps what is the right Minn Kota for you. Presented by the Fisherman Magazine, these how-to seminars continue on Friday from 2 until 6 p.m. Saturday kicks off 11 a.m. It runs all the way through 5 p.m. And then three more on Sunday from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. Show hours here for the Jersey Boat Sale and Expo. Thursday and Friday, 11 to 7. Saturday, 10 to 7, and Sunday, 10 to 5. Adult admission is $15. Uh, kids 16 and under admitted free with an adult. Discount tickets can be purchased right now. Do that before you come to the event. Go to jerseyboatexpo.com. Now, as soon as Nick and I wrap up our seminars on Thursday afternoon, we'll both be driving out west to Upper Providence Township, Pennsylvania for the Philadelphia Fishing Show at Oaks. Nick has seminars on Friday and Saturday, and me, no seminars for me. I'm just coordinating the whole circus. 46 seminars over three days in three different rooms with both freshwater and saltwater topics covered throughout. We've got captains like Wicked Tuna's uh, uh, Dave Marciano. We've got TOG record holder Tommy Daffin, Fred Gamboa, Alan Lee, Eric Kerber, Nick Perillo, and many others. Everything under the sun angling-wise will be covered. Smallmouth, snakeheads, musky, marlin, fluke fishing, bow fishing, if you're looking to get into that, and of course stripers and sheep's head, blackfish and swordfish. If it swims, it's pretty much covered this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the Philadelphia Fishing Show. That Philly show runs Friday, February 17th through Sunday at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, PA. Admission there, $12 for adults. Kids six to 12 are $6 and five and under are free, just like the parking. 
Show hours, noon to 7 Friday, 10 to 6 on Saturday, and Sunday, 10 to 5. Look for the Fisherman's Booth. As soon as you walk in the door, we'll be there. Just like the New Jersey Boat Sail and Expo, we've got a full complement of BKK hooks and those great fish bites, the Fight Club, um, beautiful, big old six inch grubs. We've got white, chartreuse, and pink. Finally, show number three this weekend for your selection, the annual Surf Day event at Brookdale Community College. That's the Jersey Shore Surfcasters Club. It's a great event always, and this year's lineup of speakers and vendors is absolutely fantastic. Plenty of local tackle shops will be there, including Fisherman Supply, Real Seat, Gabriel Tackle, Pels, Fish Heads, Betty and Nick's, and of course, yes, the Fisherman Magazine will be there as well. Three places at once. We are awesome. Actually, the Fisherman Magazine will be there with our Long Island edition staffer. You watch his videos every week, Matt Broderick. He's coming down. He'll man the table there at Brookdale, and he's also doing a seminar himself. Doors open at Brookdale Community College at 8.30 a.m. That's at 7 uh, 765. Newman Springs Road in Lincroft. One more event to tell you about this weekend. Uh, it's for you shad sharpies. The Delaware River Shad Fishermen's Association presents their James Monroe Memorial Sportsman's Hunting and Fishing Flea Market. That's from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Alpha Fire Company Banquet Hall. That's at 1109 Lee Avenue in Alpha, New Jersey. Admission is $3, although there's a special $5 early bird admission at 7 a.m. Listen. If you like shad fishing, you might love the white perch action going on right now in the salty creeks and rivers. Think Morris, maybe Fortescue. I know the Great Egg, the Toms, uh, some locations off the Raritan here, you'll find some white perch. But the best bite really has been in the Mullica River and some of those tributaries coming off the Mullica. Folks have been telling me how good the perch action is this season. Think Bloods, think Grass Shrimp, and especially think minnows. Live ones if you can get them, but we talked about it last week as well. Folks like Fanatics in Ocean City, they vacuum freeze some tasty perch-sized morsels of minnows, and they are available as well. I did speak to a couple of folks at the Palmyra show on Sunday who said the white perch action is fantastic if you can get into that right hole. Mike Martello, he told me he's all amped up for the striped bass season kick up. A kickoff, but he was antsy to get out and wet a line. He and a buddy found a nice secluded tidal creek just west of Ocean City and caught a mess of future fish cakes or fish tacos or whatever you would like to do with them. Mike said it was a fishery he hadn't even considered until he subscribed to the Fisherman Magazine. And now he says he plans to make it a part of his yearly angling rotation. Yes, you can pick up that February edition and find the article by Matt Broderick on white perch and get into it. Now, in addition to those white perch, I'm hearing this from a lot of folks, and Mike said it. He said he and his buddy were out, released a 20-inch striper on a bait that was meant for a white perch. Heard the same thing uh, from, uh, from uh, my buddy, uh, Hainsey. He caught it, he's been catching white perch and he's showing me the photos of striped bass as well. So again, March 1st, we can get back on those sedges, sod banks and riverbeds in the Garden State looking for striped bass. Uh, one of the things I will talk about in my Thursday seminar is rigging tactics for bunker, uh, for herring, for, for eels, uh, but also for some of those spring baits because you want to find those bait holder style circle hooks if you're looking to catch some uh, spring stripers starting March 1st. Now, the rundown along the coast, Bobby at Fisherman's Den said the Ocean Explorer continues to sail out of Belmar whenever the weather allows. He said there are good days and there are some slow days, but in between, folks are catching some togs still uh, out, out there uh, out of the Shark River. Now, Bobby says one of the great things to see uh, in this warming stretch that we've had of late, he says all the trucks out in the parking lot, all the boats are in and all the captains and crews are just working hard to get all those head boats in order for the spring run. So that's kind of cool to see everybody out and about. Over on the Manasquan, you still have the big Jamaica and the Paramount. Uh, uh, Paramount, they're running out of Brielle. Well, I saw Captain Willie on the Dauntless. He's got it back on the grounds, uh, again, in search of cod and blackfish. As a matter of fact, he was out on Super Bowl Sunday. And once again, the Kepti fishing crew uh, did a number uh, on some of those black, uh, blackfish and also saw one of the uh, cod in Pedro's hands as well. Yeah, Super Bowl Sunday. You've been waiting for it, right? The uh, figure we get around to the elephant in the room at some point. Yeah, my Eagles lost. Outplayed and outcoached. A lot of folks are talking about that last penalty game, that last penalty call. Oh, it cost the game. No, it didn't cost the game. Not in the final minutes. It was a ticky-tack call, 
What cost the game? A fumble, a Hurts fumble for a touchdown. Uh, two lost defensive schemes letting walk-in touchdowns going. Zero sacks and of course, horrible punt coverage. That, those items were the game changer. Good game though, one of the best Super Bowls I remember watching in a number of years. The good news, sports fans, is a pitchers and catchers report to spring training this week. And again, we're only 13 days away from the only season that really matters, other than fluke, and that's the start of striped bass on March 1st. Listen, we'll hit the beach in Manasquan in about two minutes, talk about that whale. But first, let's check in with my man George, the Pocono Outdoors guy. Well, hey, thanks, Jim. You know, that little bit of ice we had last week during that cold snap, well, that's pretty much gone, guys. There's a few spots left, maybe a couple inches here or there, but usually it's in the middle of the lake. It makes it hard getting access since the edges will thaw out first. So I think most of the guys now are focusing on that open water bite. And it looks like guys are being pretty successful. You know, we had a few guys check in. Uh, Quentin Weagle, for one, he was down in Carney's Point, New Jersey, again, tossing those Panther Martin spinners and scoring big on a couple of nice trout for the fry pan. Great work there, Quentin. Jen Wong checked in too. You know, he was up in uh, northern New Jersey uh, throwing those jerk baits for some giant pickerel. And I don't know where he's fishing these things. He keeps that close to his chest. But those pickerel are almost as big as pike. And I want to get out there and fish with Jen one of these days. Also on the Delaware River, Tim Keebler. You know, he's out pounding away on these walleyes. He's dialed in the right technique. Uh, he's been tossing a jig can with some shiners. And that's been real productive for these cold water walleyes so lots of great fishing here guys look i know everybody's waiting for that march 1st opener in the back bay down the shore but there's lots of great freshwater fishing right now until you get that opportunity so guys get in there get on them and i'll catch you next week from pennsylvania i'm george your pocono outdoors guy from the pocono mountains to the pacific coast of costa rica let's check in with captain ben jackpot sport fishing out of marina pez vela in capos Hey there guys, this is Ben Gilmore checking in from Costa Rica and the Marina Pez Vela. The offshore bite right now has been really good. We've got plenty of sailfish out there, mainly 30 to 40 miles out at the moment, the sailfish bite. We've got blue marlin, the blue marlin bite's been good. Sun trips, we're seeing one to three blue marlin, which has been nice. And there's been some real big black marlin over our offshore reefs. Quite a few fish caught over 500 pounds in the last week or two. Inshore, we've had some snook, and snapper close to the river mouths and some really nice rooster fishing going on as well at the rocks. I've had a couple of roosters close to 45, 50 pounds over the last week or two. Guys, we'd love to see you down here in Costa Rica. This is Ben Gilmore handing back to you, Jackpot's Ball Fishing. So my phone began ringing off the hook on Monday night as yet another dead whale popped up outside Manasquan Inlet, not far from where I live. Now, one of the first public posts I saw on this on Monday came from Point Pleasant Beach Mayor Paul Knietzsche uh, while standing on the beach a few hundred feet from Manasquan Inlet on Monday night. Uh, buckle up, my friends, this is about to get bumpy. The mayor ventured a guess to say that this school, size, school bus sized whale could easily come ashore in Point Pleasant. And he said, quote, I guarantee you if it does, we will personally test it and get to the bottom of this. The mayor added a message to Governor Murphy saying, Governor, when do these stop becoming coincidences? How many more will it take? And he added that he hoped that, quote, the testing is done openly and transparently. Now, it didn't come into point. It actually floated into Manasquan. I went up to see firsthand myself, uh, got a firsthand look on Tuesday morning, that big humpback 35 footer, what experts called a sub adult. It came in at the pocket and was dragged up not, uh, wow, it's just, it's horrible. One of the folks at the Marine Mammal Stranding Center I spoke with said it appears the humpback had been dead in the water for at least a week, making a really accurate necropsy rather difficult. Now there are news crews there, of course, and they included NBC News 12, but also the folks from Fox News, which of course will only trigger a lot of folks out there because certainly Fox News can't be trusted. The problem we have today when getting to the bottom of any particular news story is who do we trust to deliver the information? The left doesn't trust Fox, the right doesn't trust NBC. It's a vicious cycle weaponized by ideologues who wish to control the narrative. That said, the big question that a lot of minds have, a lot of folks are having, and I heard it along the beach in Manasquan on Tuesday, 
does seismic testing or other high resolution geophysical scale equipment associated with pre-development efforts on offshore wind production as currently underway in the New York, New Jersey marine waters, does it have any connection to this unusual sequence of whale mortality events? NOAA sent a robo spokesperson to Manasquan on Tuesday, and here's what she said to me. So again, NOAA is a science-based agency, and currently there is no evidence to indicate that the wind farms have any contribution to the whale death. So you can't say yes or no, 100% certainty that wind development or sonar and seismic testing has nothing to do with these whale deaths. I'm saying currently there is no evidence of it. Sir. Is it being investigated? We investigate everything while we perform these necropsies. In other words, if there's no evidence to show that high resolution geophysical scale equipment could be leading to these deaths, then you can't say that wind development efforts are to blame or that our own state and federal government is any way complicit. complicit. Then of course, there's no evidence to say they're not. I did get a chance to speak with Kari Martin as well on Tuesday. She's advocacy campaign manager at the New Jersey-based Clean Ocean Action. That's an organization, of course, with 30 plus years of experience protecting our ocean resources, by the way. And here's what Kari had to say. So today standing here with um, dead whale number nine in the New York, New Jersey region in a short period of time is disheartening, discouraging, disturbing. Um, and Clean Ocean Action is very concerned about the unprecedented number of dead whales we're having and experiencing here in the Northeast, um, in the in New York, New Jersey region. Um, the concern is that there's a lot happening uh, too fast um, in this region. Uh, there's permits and authorizations and projects moving forward uh, quicker than anything we've seen. Um, and we are concerned about the cumulative impacts to marine life and to our ocean resources. Um, and so sitting here looking at this whale, is a, an, it's an alarm um, to all of us that something is going on that needs due diligence and strict investigation to find out what the possible cause is. Um, and in terms of the cause, we need to look at all the possible and plausible causes there are. Um, it has to be 100% looking at everything that is going on in the region um, and considering each of them a plausible cause. Um, that includes all the extensive surveying activities um, being done by companies in preparation for offshore wind projects, uh, which number hundreds um, off the coast. Uh, we have hundreds of windmills that are being proposed with various projects. Each of those companies are doing geophysical surveys of the ocean using sonar, um, which affects the sound in the ocean and the animals that use sound to live in the ocean and, for, and have for millennia. So these companies that are doing these activities have federal permits uh, for the activities because they are harassment uh, authorizations. These harassment authorizations are authorizing harm to marine mammals, thousands of them. Uh, there are 11 companies right now that have active authorizations from the federal government to harm and harass marine life in the numbers of 63,000 animals. Clean Ocean Action, of course, was founded by Cindy Ziff back in the 1980s to lead the charge against ocean dumping. As Cindy says of that legacy, quote, we've gone from the ocean dumping capital of the world to one of the nation's only realms of the sea that is wild and free from industrialization. Not everyone, of course, appreciates Cindy's three decades of work and perhaps not all of our reporting on these issues either. Guess if you're not standing at the Kool-Aid and cold cash line, you must be the bad guy. Again, think back to what Cindy said, coastal industrialization. Results from that necropsy, by the way, could indicate any ship-related trauma. We may learn if there's plastics or other debris in the stomach. Perhaps there's some type of entanglement that caused this humpback's death. But any auditory damage from high-resolution geophysical scale equipment is probably impossible. Again, this whale, I'm told, was clearly dead over a week. Perhaps one of the two alleged floaters that captains have reported seeing in the last couple of weeks off the Jersey coast. But it comes down to the amount of detail involved in this particular necropsy. That's a necropsy is just an autopsy on an animal. I would tell you that this particular necropsy is being led by the Marine Mammal Stranding Center of Brigantine. They're the ones donned in the red gear. 
Those blue jackets are from the New York-based Atlantic Marine Conservation Society, which I believe was founded in 2016, coincidentally, about the same time that these unusual whale mortality events began. Now, the Marine Mammal Stranding Center in Brigantine have been around for a long time. I trust these folks, and I don't believe there's any wind energy money going into their pockets. They might get some grants from NOAA. The Blue Jackets, on the other hand, count as their official sponsors Equinox Wind, the Long Island Power Association, and energy specialists like VHB, Hogland, and Edgewise Energy. Again, for those of you keeping score at home, that's nine dead whales on the beach in New York and New Jersey since early December. So, is high-powered sonar or seismic testing from pre-construction of industrial offshore wind to blame? There's no evidence to show it's not. Just last week, NOAA Fisheries announced receipt of a request from Sunrise Wind, a joint venture between Orsted and Eversource Investment for incidental take regulations, level A and level B harassment of marine mammals over the course of the next five years, incidental to construction of the Sunrise Wind offshore wind farm project offshore of New York. A direct quote from that NOAA Fisheries announcement states, quote, Project activities likely to result in incidental take include pile driving and vessel-based site assessment surveys using high-resolution geophysical scale equipment. Our federal government warns that wind development testing and implementation could be bad for whales, yet when the warning comes to fruition, they fall back on lack of evidence to prove otherwise. The large print giveth, the small print taketh away. Coincidentally, um, World, Worldwide Whale Day is this Sunday, uh, February 19th. There will be a rally on the boardwalk in front of Jenkinson's in Point Pleasant Beach starting at 1 p.m. on Sunday if you want to check it out. By the way, again, second caveat. On Wednesday, Governor Murphy announced that he was moving the deadline on going 100% carbon free in New Jersey from 2050 to 2035. 12 more years you have to enjoy your gas stove, your outdoor propane tank, and of course your gas generator. Button them down, baby. Come on out and see us this week. New Jersey Boat Sale and Expo from Thursday through Sunday. We'll be at the Philadelphia Fishing Show Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'll be there in Oaks the whole time commiserating with my fellow Birds fans. Of course, go out to Surf Day, see Matt Broderick. He's going to be there all day on Saturday. All the details that you need on all these February events you'll find in the February edition of the Fisherman Magazine. By the way, we're going to print with March next week. Catch him up, and I will see you next week right here at thefisherman.com.